Hi, fifth graders. It's Tuesday, and I'm here to read the next part of The Hatchet to you. We're in the middle of chapter five. They would have started the search immediately when Brian's plane did not arrive. Yeah, they would probably come today. Probably come in here with amphibious planes, small bush planes with floats that could land right here on the lake and pick him up and take him home. But which home? The father home or the mother home? He stopped the thinking. It didn't matter. Either on to his dad or back to his mom. Either way, he would probably be home by late tonight or early morning. Home, where he could sit down and eat a large, cheesy, juicy burger with tomatoes and double fries with ketchup and a thick chocolate shake. And there came the hunger. Brian rubbed his stomach. The hunger had been there, but something else, too. Fear, pain, had held it down. Now with the thought of the burger, the emptiness roared at him. He could not believe the hunger. He had never felt it this way. The lake water had filled his stomach, but left it hungry, and now it demanded food. It screamed for food. And there was, he thought, absolutely nothing to eat. Nothing. What did they do in the movies when they got stranded like this? Oh, yes, the hero usually found some kind of plant that he knew was good to eat, and that took care of it. He just ate the plant until he was full or used some kind of cute trap to catch an animal and cook it over a slick little fire. And pretty soon he had a full eight-course meal. The trouble, Brian thought, looking around, was that all he could see was grass and brush. There was nothing obvious to eat, and aside from about a million birds and the beaver, he hadn't seen animals to trap or to cook. And even if he got one somehow, he didn't have any matches, so he couldn't have a fire. Nothing. It kept coming back to that. He had nothing. Well, almost nothing. As a matter of fact, he thought, I don't know what I've got or haven't got. Maybe I should try and figure out just how I stand. It will give me something to do, keep me from thinking of food until they come to find me. Brian had once had an English teacher, a guy named Perpich, who was always talking about being positive, thinking positive and staying on top of things. That's how he had put it, stay positive and stay on top of things. Brian thought of him now, wondered how to stay positive and stay on top of this. All that teacher would say is that I have to get motivated. He was always telling kids to get motivated. Brian changed positions, so he was sitting on his knees. He reached into his pockets and took out everything he had and laid it on the grass in front of him. It was pitiful enough. A quarter, three dimes, a nickel, and two pennies. A fingernail clipper. A billfold with the $20 bill. In case you get stranded at the airport in some small town and, and have to buy some food, his mother had said, and some odd pieces of paper. And on his belt, somehow still there, the hatchet his mother had given him. He had forgotten it and now reached around and took it out and put it on the grass. There was a touch of rust already forming on the cutting edge of the blade and he rubbed it off with his thumbs. That was it. He frowned. No, wait. If, if he was going to play the game, might as well play it right. Perpich, his old teacher, would tell him to quit messing around. Get motivated. Look at all of it, Robeson. He had on a pair of good tennis shoes, now almost dry, and socks and jeans and underwear in a thin leather belt and a t-shirt with a windbreaker so torn it hung on him in tatters. And he had a watch. He had a digital watch still on his wrist, but it was broken from the crash. The little screen blank and he took it off and almost threw it away, but stopped the hand motion and lay the watch on the grass with the rest of it. There, that was it. No, wait, one other thing. Those were all the things he had, but he also had himself. Perpich used to drum that into them. You are your most valuable asset. Don't forget that. You're the best thing you have. Brian looked around again. I wish you were here, Perpich. I'm hungry and I'd trade everything I have for a hamburger. I'm hungry. He said it out loud. 
in normal tones at first and then louder and louder until he was yelling it. I'm hungry, I'm hungry. When he stopped, there was a sudden silence, not just from, not just from him, but the clicks and the burps and bird sounds of the forest as well. The noise of his voice had startled everything and it was quiet. He looked around, listened with his mouth open and realized that in all his life, he had never heard silence before, complete silence. There had always been some sound, some kind of sound. It lasted only a few seconds, but it was so intense that it seemed to become part of him. Nothing, there was no sound. Then the bird started again in some kind of buzzing insect and then a chattering and a cawing. And soon there was the same background of sound which left him still hungry. Of course, he thought, putting the coins and the rest back in his pocket and the hatchet in his belt. Of course, if they come tonight, or even if they take as long as tomorrow, the hunger is no big thing. People have gone many days without food as long as they've got water. Even if they don't come until late tomorrow, I'll be all right. Lose a little weight, maybe, but the first hamburger and malt and fries will bring it right back. A mental picture of hamburger, the way they showed it in the television commercials, thundered into his thoughts, rich colors, the meat juicy and hot. He pushed that picture away. So even if they didn't find him until tomorrow, he thought he would be all right. He had plenty of water, although he wasn't sure if it was good and clean or not. He sat again by the tree, his back against it. There was still a thing bothering him. He wasn't quite sure what it was, but it kept chewing at the edge of his thoughts. Something about the plane and the pilot that would change things. Ah, there it was. The moment when the pilot had his heart attack and his right foot had jerked down on the rudder pedal and the plane had slewed sideways. What did that mean? Why did that keep coming into his thinking that way, nudging and pushing? It means a voice in his thought said that they might not be coming for you tonight or even tomorrow. When the pilot pushed the rudder pedal, the plane had jerked to the side and assumed a new course. Brian could not remember how much it had pulled around but it wouldn't have had to be much because after that, with the pilot dead, Brian had flown for hour after hour on that new course. Well away from the flight plan the pilot had filed. Many hours, at maybe 160 miles an hour, even if it was only a little off course, with that speed and time, Brian might now be sitting several hundred miles off to the side of the recorded flight plan and they would probably search most heavily at first along the flight plan course. They might go out to the side a little, but he could easily be three, four hundred miles to that side. He could not know, could not think of how far he might have flown wrong because he didn't know the original course and didn't know how much they had pulled sideways. Quite a bit. That's how he remembered it. Quite a jerk to the side. It pulled his head over sharply when the plane had swung around. They might not find him for two or three days. He felt his heartbeat increase as the fear started. The thought was there, but he fought it down for a time and pushed it away. Then it exploded out. They might not find him for a long time. And the next thought was there as well. That thought that they might never find him. But that was panic and he fought it down and tried to stay positive. They searched hard when a plane went down. They used many men in planes and they would go to the side. They would, they would know he was off from the flight plan. He had talked to the man on the radio. They would somehow know it would be all right. They would soon find him. Maybe not tomorrow, but soon, soon. Gradually, like sloshing oil, like sloshing oil, his thoughts settled back and the panic was gone. Say they didn't come for two days. No, say they didn't come for three days, even push that to four days. He could live with that. He would have to live with that. He didn't want to think of them taking longer, but let's say four days. 
he had to do something. He couldn't just sit at the bottom of this tree and stare down at the lake for four days and nights. He was in deep woods and didn't have any matches. He couldn't make a fire. There were large things in the woods. There were wolves, he thought, and bears, other things. In the dark, he would be in the open here, just sitting at the bottom of a tree. He looked around suddenly, felt the hair on the back of his neck go up. Things might be looking at him right now, waiting for him, waiting for dark so they could move in and take him. He fingered the hatchet at his belt. It was the only weapon he had, but it was something. He had to have some kind of shelter. No, make that more. He had to have some kind of shelter and he had to have something to eat. He pulled himself to his feet and jerked the back of his shirt down before the mosquitoes could get at it. He had to do something to help himself. I have to get motivated, he thought, remembering his old teacher. Right now, I'm all I've got, and I have to do something. We'll start chapter 6 tomorrow.